So in this video, I'm asking five highly qualified nutrition experts about the most effective science-based strategies for losing body fat. No matter how you slice it, uh, the relapse statistics are still pretty bad. I don't want you to get too hungry. I don't want you to get too full. While none of these strategies are incorrect necessarily, they're also not required. Uh, stuff that does, in fact, increase energy expenditure. Eventually, they will come off of that stubborn area. Your body has to pull it from somewhere eventually. So to get everyone on the same page, first I spoke with Dr. Eric Helms about the fat loss fundamentals. Now, Eric has published a ton of science-based papers in peer-reviewed journals, including recommendations for physique athletes, protein intakes, during caloric restriction and even binge eating behavior. So he started out by reminding me that on a physiological level, fat loss is very well understood and actually quite simple. Yep, so fat loss comes from an energy deficit. So consuming less calories than you need to maintain weight. Uh, real briefly, you can technically see your body fat percentage go down, eating at maintenance while you gain muscle, and you could possibly even, like if you had a really strong stimulus to gain weight, maybe lose, or gain muscle I should say, maybe lose fat in a, in a small surplus perhaps, but energetically, you need to be in an energy deficit. And on our call, Eric emphasized that it isn't enough to just lose weight. We want to lose as much of that weight from fat as possible and as little of that weight from muscle as possible. And to help us do that, he laid out five keys for maximizing fat loss while preventing muscle loss. And I'll do these in order of importance. So one is gotta have the energy deficit. Uh, the second thing is, well, how do we know that what we're gonna lose is fat? And the best way to do that is to stimulate muscle to stay. So that is progressive resistance exercise. So that's the, the best tool we have. After that, the next most important thing is making sure that the size of the deficit is appropriate. A good general rule of thumb is somewhere between 0.5 to as much as 1.5% of your body weight. Uh, but I wouldn't use that higher end unless you are pretty high in body fat. After that, you probably wanna have sufficient protein intake. A uh, good rule of thumb is I would say higher than two grams per kg. And if you are someone very high in body fat, quick rule of thumb that normally puts you in the right range so you're not over consuming based on your lean mass is to use your centimeters in height. That typically scales pretty well for most people. And then finally, the thing I'd, I'd mention is an appropriate volume of cardio. So you don't want to completely get your deficit from it. And modality and timing is important here. So not right before training. And you don't want something that has a ton of high impact or eccentric components. So a lot of running would probably be not the main choice. Decent rule of thumb is make sure that your volume of cardio is no more than half of your volume of resistance training, which is something I pulled out of my butt, but it's a decent line in the sand. And to make it slightly more specific, Eric suggested doing no more than 30 minutes of low intensity cardio per day and no more than one to two high intensity interval sessions per week. Again, assuming you're trying to prevent muscle loss as much as possible. So with the most important variables in place, next I ask Eric about the different types of foods we should eat. Are some foods simply better than others when it comes to fat loss? A lot of people, especially in the mainstream, will obsess over the types of foods they're eating. Like people seem to think these foods are better for fat loss and these foods are worse for fat loss. Where do you stand on the, it really comes down to hitting the macros versus there really are some foods that are inherently more fat burning than others? Um, both of those statements can be true in the right context. So it does just come down to macros. Uh, however, there is some data that suggests highly processed foods have a lower TEF, so the thermic effect, so the energy output side would be lower, um, but it would just come down to lowering your macros even more. So it still always comes down to energy balance. It also comes down to, do you want to make your fat loss process easier to follow and less likely to rebound? Or do you just care about getting lean for a temporary time period? If it's the latter and you just don't care about white knuckling it, then yeah, you could just lower the deficit, track your macros, not worry about it and have some semblance of variety to make sure you're covering your micronutrient basis. But that's not most people if they really think about it. So I would say for enhancing satiety, preserving energy output, uh, and general control of, of hunger signaling, you probably want to consume mostly single ingredient food items and not eating a lot of hyper palatable foods. But there is a balance to be had there to where you don't want to make these foods off limits. You need to have your adult card is the way you like to put it. Like if someone says, you're not allowed to have this anymore, the natural rebellious teenager comes out. So you need to feel like I'm making a conscious choice that I'm a part of. These aren't hard rules. This isn't a black and white approach, but most of my meals are gonna be fruits, vegetables, lean proteins, and a carb source. And then if I feel like it, if I really want to, and it would help me actually follow my diet, sure, I'll have a snack or a treat and I'll work it in. So after Eric laid out the fat loss fundamentals, next I spoke with someone who's extremely specialized in getting people absolutely shredded. Cliff Wilson is one of the best natural bodybuilding coaches on the planet. 
His clients have won 125 pro cards, 87 professional titles, and 13 world championships in natural bodybuilding. And I wanted to get him on to ask what the difference is between getting beach lean and getting ultra shredded for a competition. I would classify beach lean as slightly six pack abs versus, you know, just absolutely shredded. Um, a lot of what gets you there is the same. It's just the degree to which you do it. You can be a little inconsistent and still get beach lean, but you can't really be inconsistent and get completely shredded because every competitor, you know, when they start, start their diet for a show, they at one point reach beach lean and then you just keep going. So I would say the, the duration of the diet is probably the single biggest factor along with the degree to which you are diligent. Now, I should say that Cliff noted that he wouldn't necessarily recommend that you try to get this lean, especially if your main goal is to improve your health. And he agreed that getting truly shredded isn't even a sustainable goal for most people. But I did find it interesting that even in these extreme cases of fat loss, it still ultimately just boils down to the same fundamental principles that Eric Helms laid out. You just push them a bit further and for longer. But one thing I was curious about was stubborn fat. Are there any tricks for losing that last bit of fat off body parts that just won't seem to let go? I would say there's two things. First off, generally the more developed a muscle group is, it will look leaner. Because if you have a given amount of fat in a particular area, like if I, if I hold more fat in my shoulders, which some people do, if I build more muscle in my shoulders, that same amount of body fat will be spread across a larger area. So you will look leaner. It's, it's one of the reasons more muscular people tend to look leaner in general. But beyond that, stubborn body fat is largely gonna be determined by genetics and gender and things like that. So I, I would say that if everything leans out first, except for your stubborn area, if you continue to diet, eventually they will come off of that stubborn area. Your body has to pull it from somewhere eventually. Right. One thing that I've noticed with this is sometimes you might have someone, let's just say it's a guy who just can't get the lower abs to show. Like there's just always a little bit or a, low, a little bit of lower back fat that won't come off and we, we can keep dieting them. But at a certain point, it almost seems like they just start really stringing out or they're, I don't know if they're losing muscle, but it's like, they're just so zapped of energy. Like how do you deal with that situation? That's a tough one as a coach. Usually what will happen is once you start to tap into that, that uh, stubborn body fat, um, you've typically reached the point of significant discomfort. People who have gotten to that level for the first time, they're probably gonna get a little bit stringier than somebody who's never gotten to that level because at the risk of sounding, you know, engaging in hyperbole, it's very traumatic to sometimes try to get that stubborn body fat off for the first time. Mm -hmm. And so you are almost bound to lose some muscle mass. You've probably seen this with competitors over the years or even with yourself. Then the next time you try to do it again, it's almost like you're mentally and physically prepared for what you're going to engage in and then you can get it off the second and third time without it being as traumatic either mentally or physically right right that's super well said okay great so after talking to cliff about some intelligent ways to get completely diced for a competition next i wanted to speak with someone who's more focused on sustainable approaches to fat loss so i got sports nutritionist sohi lee on the line who did her master's thesis on the psychology of eating behavior and she explained a few of the biggest mental roadblocks people run into and some of her best tips for women well, I think generally speaking, men and women tend to make a lot of the same mistakes, but what I see a lot happening a lot, maybe I see it more in women because I work primarily with women, but what I've seen is that they don't want to hear about a more moderate strategy that they can utilize for their plan. They want to hear, cut out these entire food groups. Um, you can't eat dairy, you have to go keto, try intermittent fasting. And as you know, while none of these strategies are incorrect necessarily, they're also not required in order to see fat loss progress. And I made this mistake to myself for many, many years where I focused more on what I thought was the perfect plan on paper, but I didn't consider my current lifestyle and my current preferences and what would actually be feasible for me to consistently execute day after day after day. So what happened was uh, very common where you get very excited in the beginning. And this is a very common psychology mistake that people make where they rely too much on motivation in the beginning. They underestimate how difficult some journey will actually be. And then one week in, two weeks in, three weeks in, they quit. And then they're on to the next thing, right? And um, I think we call it shiny object syndrome. So they're always looking for the next fad diet, the next cool thing that sounds interesting rather than, oh, well, what tweaks can I make to my current lifestyle to nudge me in the right direction over time? And throughout our conversation, so he emphasized how important it is to create repeatable habits. So you don't need to be so reliant on self-control for every decision about food. 
So there's this, always this idea that if you want something, you have to just try harder, right? Or if you fail on your goal, it's because you didn't have enough self-control. The research consistently shows that self-control is very, very helpful in the initial formation of habits, but it should not be utilized as a ongoing strategy for long-term behavior change. And the key feature of a habit it, unlike self-control, it does not require cognitive effort for the habit to take place. So if we go into your kitchen or your home environment, your work environment, wherever you spend a lot of time, are there things we can change around to make maybe the higher calorie, the more calorie dense foods more annoying to access, right? If I put it at the top of your pantry, way in the back, chances are your intake is going to drop substantially because you're not gonna be bothered to go that extra effort. We call this designing for laziness. And I like, I like to say humans are lazy by default and how can we use that to our advantage? Another example, um, this, and this is called a choice architecture intervention. Let's say you're at work on your desk, there's a clear bowl of, I don't know, M&Ms or Skittles or something and within arm's reach, right? So it's visible, it's close, it's very easy to access. But if you were to, let's say, put the candy in an opaque container or put a lid on it, or move it farther away so I have to stand up and walk over or simply put it in a drawer out of sight, my intake will drastically go down again without my really conscientiously realizing that it's happening. And many of the points so he made were supported on my next call with Dr. Lane Norton, who also has a competitive background, but has focused more of his published work lately toward understanding why well over half of diets fail and what we can do to help people keep the weight off once they've lost it. There's no one diet that pops out as, hey, the Mediterranean diet was best, or hey, low carb was best, or hey, plant-based was best. Because if you equate them for calories, then all the diets do about the same. And a lot of that is that dietary adherence is pretty terrible across the board. No matter how you slice it, uh, the relapse statistics are still pretty bad. The more people regain it than keep it off. But despite the fact that weight maintenance is a challenge for many people, Lane has identified the five most common weight maintenance strategies used by people who were successful with long-term weight loss. What we do see is these habits and behaviors. And the first one and the most common one is that these people practice some form of cognitive restraint. So that can be in the form of calorie counting. It can be in the form of I'm not eating past a certain hour or I'm not eating before a certain hour. So time restricted eating uh, points like with Weight Watchers or carb restriction or fat restriction. There's there's any number of ways that you can restrict your dietary intake. Another one that may be a little bit surprising to people is people who lose weight and keep it off tend to self-monitor quite regularly, meaning they weigh themselves pretty often. I don't wanna become dogmatic about that point. I'm not saying you can't lose weight and keep it off if you're not weighing yourself regularly, but what that does do is it provides feedback. I and mean, I'm not talking about like a day-to-day -day fluctuation because people get too wrapped up in that. But if over the course of weeks and months, you see that scale going up, then you can correct for that. And then a uh, third point is not surprising, which is regular exercise. Probably the major reason is there's good evidence that exercise sensitizes you to satiety signals. And then some smaller points that bubble up as well is people tend to use structured programs when they have success at kind of the highest level, you know, it's like hiring a nutrition coach or a dietitian. But even like people, people make fun of things like Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig or Nutrisystem or whatever, but those people on average do perform better because just kind of winging it with no plan doesn't usually work out very well. And then something I thought was interesting in a recent study, they found that the strongest characteristic in this particular study that was associated with weight loss maintenance was what's called low recency. Basically, do you value long-term data more than short-term data? A very easy example of that would be, well, I really wanna eat this donut right now because I know it'll make me feel good. But if that doesn't fit you know, your daily caloric requirement, okay, do I value feeling good right now more than I value wanting to get to my goal? So those people with low recency would choose the long-term goal over the short-term feeling. Lane also explained that even though it will require some restraint, you should be able to maintain your weight loss by eating more calories than you were eating while losing the weight. So once you reach your goal weight, you can start to increase your calories to a higher intake. And gradually, if you build the habits and behaviors we've been outlining, it should start to feel less and less restrictive over time. 
for me, I struggled with dietary adherence when I first got into bodybuilding until I switched to a more flexible dieting approach. And just the fact that I knew I could eat what I wanted so long as it fit my macros, I had no problems with adherence after that. It feels easy. I continue to do it to this day. It doesn't give me hardly any stress. But there are some people, for them, tracking macros is extremely stressful. You know, I've heard from some people who say, you know, I tried tracking macros, I hated it, I did low carb, and that feels easy to me. And so what I would say to people is, find the method of restriction that feels the least restrictive for you as an individual, but also don't assume that what feels easy for you will also feel easy for somebody else, because I've also made that mistake as well. And last but not least, I wanted to have an expert on supplements set the record straight about fat burners. Now, Dr. Eric Trexler has published a whole lot of papers on a variety of different supplements, including caffeine, creatine, omega-3s, and plenty more. And in our chat, he outlined the different types of fat burners that look good in theory, and whether or not any of them are actually worth using. You know, there are plenty of types of supplements out there that are marketed for fat loss. So supplements that are supposed to enhance fat oxidation, things like carnitine and CLA, uh, stuff that does, in fact, increase energy expenditure, caffeine, capsaicin, uh, ephedrine, yohimbine, stuff like that. You'll also see things that are marketed as kind of hunger reducers. So most anything that's marketed as a thermogenic will also typically impact hunger. Um, but then you've got other stuff like ginger and 5-HTP. And then there's also stuff that's marketed as kind of nutrient blockers. So things that modify or block the absorption of, of fat or carbohydrate. And so all of those on paper sound great, but the problem is they all have some kind of flaw. For things like caffeine, you worry about if I try to use this consistently, will I habituate to it? There are some on that list that just have quality control issues like yohimbine. Some have side effects like yohimbine and ephedrine. And there, there of course, are some nutrient blockers that work too well <laughs> and, and cause really uh, unfavorable GI distress. And then for most of them, the issue is that there's just a lack of really strong conclusive evidence. And most of the ones that have been really well studied, you'll find that you could achieve what they do uh, with much easier, more affordable methods. So let's let's put it all together now. Like someone comes to you and they're like, I wanna lose fat. What supplements do I take? Are there any that you really would recommend to them? M my recommendations would be the same for whether they're doing a fat loss phase or not. So I would still say like, yeah, there are some supplements that can help you during your fat loss phase. They just don't cause fat loss, right? So things like creatine monohydrate, uh, whey protein if you're not getting enough protein through your food because high protein diets are, are fantastic for fat loss goals. When we're on a weight loss diet, sometimes it's hard. We, we'll restrict fat and it's hard to get essential fatty acids into the diet. And so fish oil could be a really good uh, a really good option there. There might be some uh, vitamins or miner minerals that, that we're getting less of when we start reducing food intake. So it's another good reason why you might consider taking a, a multivitamin uh, or even a vitamin D supplement as well. And before we wrap it up, I do want to direct you guys to a few things that I think you'll find helpful when it comes to your own fat loss plan. First, I've linked a few amazing resources that my guests have to offer down below, whether it be a tracking app, an ebook, or some other content. I also have an ebook called The Ultimate Guide to Body Recomposition, which outlines exactly how to set up your diet, whether your main goal is to lose fat, build muscle, or do both equally at the same time. And I'd encourage you guys to all go follow my guests on the respective platforms. They all put out great science-based content, so I'll have all that linked down below as well. So don't forget to leave the video a thumbs up if you guys enjoyed it, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys all here in the next one.